All right, thanks very much. Life is precious. So I would say be careful. And I think I really enjoyed very much, and I would say again, uh, the preceding presentation, which was giving very informative uh, details about, um, I would say, aspects that I will not talk about, but that were clearly uh, mentioned in the presentation, is that when we say life is precious, take care. Um, the medical staff and the technicians actually should be careful about themselves uh, because one of the aspects of reducing the dose is of course reducing the dose to the manipulators and not only the patients. If we look at what's happening in the medical field today, it's clear that we have more and more of interventional and imaging procedures and they are becoming more and more complex. So that means that the medical staff or uh, the diagnostic requirements will try to push on one direction where you need more information, thus you need to be able to go to lower resolutions and if you want to go to lower resolution you need to improve the signal to noise ratio by way and there are no different ways to do it. And I would say in nuclear medicine either you increase the dose and in CT the same story, you increase the MIS or on the other hand uh, you will have to acquire for longer times. Now we have to take care about operators and about patients. There is actually a situation in the US as you know where we have probably one case per month where people are complaining about uh, radiation burn and there is also an increasing amount of uh, regulations that are being implemented. It is probably today the most controversial uh, fact in or topic in medical imaging today and you know with internet and I realize this with my kids, I realize this with my neighbors, um, they know I'm working in the medical field for years and they are also uh, very well informed because they go on internet, if you have an examination you have to go to, some people is calling me, so there is a big concern from the patient side, where they're becoming more uh, informed, conscious and anxious. But then on the other hand, and I was talking about uh, the cases in the US, um, on the other hand there is a need to protect the medical staff and to protect the, uh, the administration. Now molecular imaging has, uh, has moved toward hybrid imaging. Everybody knows that Today we're talking about SPECT CT and then we're talking about PET CT and we talked about PET MR. And if you look at the market, worldwide market, it's interesting to see that over the three last years, 60 to 65 percent of the nuclear medicine gamma cameras have been SPECT CTs. Now the SPECT CTs on gamma cameras you find with 2, 4, 6, 8, 16 slices. And you also find systems with flat panel technology. The PET standalone systems, you don't find them anymore, this has disappeared. But the PET CTs are now proposed with 4, 8, 6, 16, 20, 24, 32, whatever, up to 20, uh, 128 slices. And you will see that there is a reason behind, and in, for example, is that in uh, the United States, due to the fact that we can actually very much reduce the acquisition time on the PET side, 50% uh, of the equipment, the PET CT, is being used in uh, CT acquisition only. And that, of course, drives the CT technology to higher uh, slices. And, uh, as you know, PET is being integrated to MR. Now, in non-hybrid imaging, and I would say if you look at uh, gamma cameras, the radiation burden to the patient only depends on the pharmaceutical and how much you inject. Now, whatever you do, 20 minute examination, whatever you do, an hour of examination, it's not going to affect anything on the patient's dose, only the image quality. Now, in hybrid devices, we have the same thing, but on top of this, we have the CT uh, dose. And as you know, and as we have seen now, CT can uh, actually go and range from 2 to 20 millisievert per examination, which is actually an important dose. 
So if you think about uh, how can we work on reduce the dose uh, to the patient, there are actually two possible ways to look at this. And the one is, what can we do on the SPECT or the PET detection technology to reduce the dose, uh, the injected dose that is needed? And that has a term, we can call this overall sensitivity, of course. And then on the other, day, on the other hand, uh, the CT dose needs to be reduced. And that is more a technology that comes from the CT part. We have to take about patient to reduce the dose and also trying to find the best compromise in between examination time and uh, dose reduction. The operator, you need to make sure that a lot of things can be done from away from the patient, especially in PET-CT. And then the administration, where you need to help them in case of cords. And of course, you have to have today all these dose information management. Now let's look at spec CT first. And do we have a laser beam somewhere? No laser beam. Okay. When when you look at the spec CT, you can see that actually we can work on different things. The first thing we can work on is detection. Then the next thing will be software. We will find dedicated solutions for hard uh, gamma cameras, and then you can find on some systems automation which will reduce the dose to the workers. And then on the CT side, you have the detection technology. The fact that we're using spiral CT, all the parameters and the things that you can uh, move on the CT side. There is an important thing is that you find on modern CTs is the auto exposure and then pediatric solutions eventually. Let's talk about detection first. Um, I always, you know, I started with gamma cameras in uh, something like 77. That was the very beginning of gamma cameras. And I must confess that from 77 to, I would say, probably the years 90, I have been able to notice a kind of evolution. You went down with the resolution and you went up with the sensitivity and then you, in, you have been able to uh, improve the, um, the uniformity of the cameras. All in, if you think about what happened in between 90 and today, I would say not very much. The digital detectors came in, and as soon as everything was digitized, you have some tricks that you can do, but you all know. Look at the NEMA specifications. If you ask me, now tell me what is better, is it the Philips, G, uh, Siemens camera, I will tell you. If you have to look at the NEMA specifications, it's very hard to find differences, and it's normal. The thing is that we have reached the technology of uh, sodium iodine uh, limits. That's clear. So what can you work on? And a gamma camera actually is typically a combination of a detector and a collimator. And there is some work that you can do on collimators. And for example, uh, and you know how we build collimators, the collimators are looking like this. So what you do, you have uh, leaded foils that you will glue to together. And when you glue them together, you get the septa and the septa is now adapted uh, to the energy and uh, to what you want to do. I mean, say there's a compromise in between the resolution and the, um, the sensitivity. But uh, there is a way to improve collimators. And if you look at this collimator, for example, which is the most common way of doing, this is the normal technology, you will see that taking a foil like this and gluing it with a foil like this, you will actually end up with different uh, thicknesses in the in the patterns where the area here where it is glued together is actually I would say consuming unnecessary um, uh, detection surface because what you need is this thickness and what you actually get is twice the thickness because you glue them together there are some techniques to reduce the collimator septa and by doing this you gain a huge factor. You go up to 30% more sensitivity. And that means either you reduce the acquisition time or you reduce the dose to the patient by one third, which is not nothing. Now, the other thing is that because we have reached the, the, the limit of uh, sodium iodine is to try to find out whether there are no other 
uh, detectors for uh, gamma rays. And actually, there are detectors. There are solid-state detectors. There is a technology based today on uh, CZT, cadmium uh, zinc telluride. This is a pixelized uh, semiconductor. It's very nice. The resolution is pretty good. The only problem with this thing is the price. And there is a compromise always somewhere in between uh, the price that you want to put in a technology and what is really affordable by the market. So this technology, as we will see, is excellent, it's very modern, and it's being used today in dedicated camera cameras, uh, cardiac cameras because there is a way to reduce the field of view. So this, for small field of view cameras, is a good solution. Now let's think about the software. Do I have nuclear medicine Dr. Sia? Can you raise your hand? There must be a few, eh? Okay. Now, there is a challenge. What image quality is this? This is good image quality. And this is normal, because this is a normal standard injected dose patient with, I would say, a normal standard uh, acquisition time. If you look, 17 minutes, 20 minutes, that's the time you need for a whole body. And now you say, okay, I will reduce the dose by 50%, or I will reduce the acquisition time by 50% and bring me the images. And now I'm confused, and you are confused, because uh, clinically, to diagnose this is perfect, but to diagnose this one is pretty tricky. And that is where today uh, software can help you. So there is a company that brings on the market something that is called half-time imaging, and this works on um, static images, I mean planar images. This is not an iterative reconstruction algorithm. It is an iterative process, but it is not an iterative rigorous. So what is it based on? It is actually based on a technology that comes from uh, the astronomy. The astronomy has the same problem as nuclear medicine. There is a lot of noise and very few signal. And these guys want to see the stars as far as possible. So they have invented, there is a, long, a, a lot of very strong mathematical guys in astrophysics, as you can imagine. So they have found a technology which is actually very clever. And what, and what is the technology doing? If you look at this, this uh, planar image here, the signal-to-noise ratio in that area is not the same as the one in that area and absolutely not the same in, this, in the one in that area. And you know that in nuclear medicine, to improve the image quality, we're filtering. But if you filter, you smooth the image. If you smooth the image, you lose resolution. So what is this technology actually doing is that it's, like, it's kind of iterative process. It looks at a pixel somewhere, and it would look around this pixel what is the signal-to-noise ratio. And depending on this, it will select the best and the less uh, smoothing filter possible. So what you're doing, where you have noise, you filter more, you improve uh, the signal-to-noise ratio uh, aspect, and by doing this actually, and by doing this pixel per pixel, you actually get an image that gives you an impression of two times less signal-to-noise ratio. And that means that you can divide the acquisition time by two, or reduce the dose to the patient by 50%, which is actually, and which has actually very much been done uh, during the crisis of uh, molybdenum, you know, technetium. You all know what is a collimator. What is the problem of a collimator? Is that, and why do the technologists, and why do the, why do the doctors fight against technologies because they are too far from the patient? Why did the companies have to invent or to contour? to make sure that when you do the acquisition on your patient, you are as close as possible from the, the collimator phase. And why is that? But this is because of this factor. If you look at the collimator septa, the resolution here is perfect. But the further on you move, and the less you will be resolutive. So actually, the resolution pattern of each septa is like a cone, a 3D cone, that loses resolution in the distance. Now, engineers are very clever and I'm very proud because one thing I need to tell you, I'm not Dr. Van der Voort, I'm an engineer. And I'm very proud to be an engineer because these guys have invented something very clever. Now, if you know what the parameters are of your collimator during iterative reconstruction, you can bring this back. You do a kind of resolution recovery and by doing this, this is now for uh, tomographic images, you will be able to reduce the acquisition time by 50%. 
or again, reduce uh, the, the dose to the patient. And this is an example, for example, in cardiology where um, by using this 3D iterative reconstruction, you implement the real transfer function uh, depending on uh, the distance to the patient. And the gantries are clever today. They know what the distance is to the patient. And then, optionally, because we're now talking about uh, spec TT, you could eventually also derive an attenuation correction map from the CT slices and apply this uh, to uh, the image. So you will really improve the image quality a lot. And that gives you cardiology in eight minutes in case of doing cardiology in uh, 16 minutes. But there are other solutions. Now, it was interesting to see that you were doing like 40% of cardiology in your department. Is that correct? Yeah. So which is a big number because the numbers I had in mind when I was working in Europe was much closer to 30%. Now in these areas, it's much more like in the US, where I think that you are closer to 45% and even over 50%. So cardiology is a very big demanding uh, examination in nuclear medicine. And that is why companies have been working on dedicated solutions. And actually there are two ways of doing it. The first way is to say, okay, I have this large field of view gamma camera, which I can use for everything. I can do tomography, I can do whole body. And now if I need to do cardiac, I have a problem because this big detector sees my heart beat like this. So actually you're wasting all the area around the detector where you're not doing any, I would say, clinical cardiac uh, acquisition. So if there is a clever way to make your heart looking bigger on the camera, then you will increase the sensitivity. And that is actually what you call a cardiofocal solution. So what you're doing here is that you build a dedicated collimator that will focus on the heart and it will enlarge the image on the field of view of your camera. And by doing this, you actually uh, multiply the surface that the detector is being used for by a factor of two by two. That means that you, you gain four times um, sensitivity on the system. But this implies that you have different, different things on the system and uh, this solution, for example, the smart zoom collination solution requires three components. The first thing, you need to have this dedicated collimator, which is high-tech collimator. Then the next thing is that you need cardiocentric acquisition because if you start doing tomography around the heart, the normal way, the heart will get off the, off the field of view of your cardiofocal thing. So you really need to have a cardiofocal um, uh, contour about the heart just to make sure that the heart is always in the middle of the field of view and at the same distance of the collimator. If you do this, on top of this, if you have a dedicated reconstruction, uh, you will get uh, uh, four times faster or four less times those to the patient in cardiac acquisition. And if you have a SPECT CT, you can even add on top of this uh, CT-based attenuation correction. Okay? Now the other approach is the one from another company, uh, the one who is using uh, the CZT detectors. And what they do, they do the invert, uh, the invert principle of a pinhole. You all use pinholes. Why do you use pinhole? And how do you use pinhole? You use pinhole collimator very close to the thyroid. Why? Because it has this magnification factor, again. So you will gain in resolution and sensitivity. Now if you move away, and that's what you can see from the drawing here, if you move this pinhole collimator away, you will have a kind of inversion of the function. And actually, this heart, looking a bit like this, you can now make it smaller. And what you try to do is to get uh, this heart looking as much as possible on a small detector because CZT is really expensive. And that is actually a solution proposed by General Electric where they also use, you see they're using multiple detector, so the camera is a multiple detector camera without any motion, so you put the patient there is no motion, and uh, the 3D images or the, the, all the projection that you need will automatically be acquired by multiple pinholes. So every pinhole is looking at different distances and by doing this you will go down to about the same factor as the preceding solution. So you will be close to five minute acquisition uh, for your heart studies. Uh, 
Now, if you speak about uh, spec CT, of course, you do in spiral CT, and you know that in spiral CT, and, and you know CT represents probably 50% of the dose to the patient if you're not careful. So you, you must be able to work on all these different parameters, and it is difficult. I'm coming from nuclear medicine just as you are. And you know, for me, oh, CT, you know, how many MS and what KV and the, the thickness of slices and all this is a little bit tricky. And thanks God, I would say, uh, companies have been clever and they came with uh, automated things. One thing that is important is, of course, the same as for PET, is on the CT side, fast detectors. And today the companies are providing uh, fast detector technology with short outer glow and that really gives you a high image quality and signal to noise ratio and that allows you of course to do fast acquisitions with less MAS. Now one important thing is the auto exposure. Now if you look at a diagnostic CT of course there is one first thing you realize is that if we start looking at the patient from here to there, that's what we're doing spiraling, we move forward you see that the attenuation, uh, the linear attenuation here, will not be the same as here because actually along this longitudinal axis, you will have different thickness of patients and then you will have different attenuation. And in order to keep the same noise level in the images, which is really what you need to do in CT, you have to do uh, some kind of uh, longitudinal uh, analysis. And you can see, sorry, I'll come back to the, here. You can see that, for example, uh, to get the same image quality in the shoulders, you need 140 MAS, where on the thorax you only need 55. It's normal. There is lungs and the lungs are empty. Abdominal, 110. Now this is, on top of this, I would say there is another problem, is that when we do spiral CT, the CT is actually running the detector and the tube running around the patient. Now there is a big difference. If you look at me, from here, or from there. And the thing, clearly the thing is that you have different attenuation in the same size depending on where the angulation is from the UV detector. And you have to correct for that as well. And that is actually now called uh, the angular dose. The, the angular uh, profile. The one thing that everybody is doing, all companies are doing it, is that what you do is you do a topogram. This is a very fast, uh, very low dose CT. Uh, it's not even spiraling, you know, it's just an image. And based on this, the computer or the image analyze, analyzer will give you this uh, longitudinal profile, seen anterior posterior, okay, seen from this side. Now, very complex algorithms can calculate from this profile what is the profile from the lateral. And then you get this curve for the lateral, and the computer will use the average of the two to modulate the current. So if you actually say, okay, I will have this, I have this profile, that is actually the profile, the MAS profile that uh, the system will be using for uh, trying to control or controlling the dose to the patient. But on top of this, you can do better. And uh, you could eventually have systems that are doing uh, on-the-fly regulation on the tube. And actually, what's happening in these things, if it works, and it doesn't want to work, it doesn't matter, I will explain you what it does. While you do the first uh, 180 degree of a rotation with your CT, you get the information about the attenuation map in that slide, slice. And the current that you will be using, for example, for that slice here, will be that average. So you will say, I need, I would say, 40 MA, that position. So you will start with 40 MA, and during this first 180 degree rotation, you keep 40 MA. So you have a full dose 40 MA acquisition, half size. But then because you have the information about attenuation, you can eventually say, now that I have this profile, I know that I don't need 
40 uh, MA in all the different angulations. And this is real-time modulation. And it's dramatic. It reduces the dose up to 60% to a normal acquisition. Okay? So there are some companies provi providing this um, automatic uh, way of doing. And then, of course, for kids, you have today uh, pediatric CT protocols. And it's pretty uh, easy to understand that. Uh, small bodies don't need the same, they don't have the same attenuation, you don't need the same energy, okay? and energy is actually uh, defined by uh, KEV. Another thing that you can work on uh, on the SPECT CT side to reduce the dose actually to the users or to the technologist is uh, something that's called fully integrated uh, quality control and I just hope that Okay, I will, I will show the movies afterwards uh, offline, which is not a big issue. But actually, you all know how much you spend. Uh, okay, I, I have to remove the collimators, I have to put the point source. The first thing is you have to measure the point source. Then eventually, if you want to do uh, extrinsic with uh, flat field, you need to inject your phantom, you need to shake the phantom. This procedure is actually a procedure where the technologist or the physicist are getting a lot of dose, and really a lot of radiation. And uh, there is a company that came out with a system where they're using line sources, and the, the line sources are actually included in the bed, fully sealed. And when you do uh, quality control, you just close the door, push a button and say, please do the calibration, the system does it for you. So it's very comfortable on one side, but the, the efficiency to reduce the dose to the technologist, and I would say on top of this, the reliability on uh, doing this automatically is of course very high. These are examples uh, from the 16 size CT, and it really uh, comes back to what you were saying, because I was looking at your numbers. Um, the average dose is actually in between 1 and uh, 2 uh, millisievert. If you, if you want to use, I would say, a low dose attenuation map and localization, with, which usually uh, is more than enough uh, for SPECT CT examinations. Any questions before I move to PET CT? We can have the questions afterwards as well. Now, if you look at the PET-CT, okay, the PET-CT is exactly the same. We have two challenges, actually, in, in molecular imaging or in imaging in general, is that one thing you want to do is, and this is why we have this old man like me, he wants to, to be as short as possible in, in the camera because, you know, my back is painful. And now, on the other hand, the kids, the kids need as less as possible dose. So there is a compromise in between the acquisition time and the dose to the patient. Again, if you look at the PET, there are different things you can work on. The first thing is that you can work on the detector chain, and then, of course, uh, you can work on the electronics and on uh, the reconstruction afterwards. So if you look at the parameters that will affect uh, PET performance, and I'm talking now about uh, sensitivity on a PET, the first thing that will really affect it is the way you do the acquisition. If you are, about 10 years ago, we were all doing what we were calling 2D PET acquisition, and this, is, uh, this will be shown on the next slide. Going from 2D to 3D PET acquisition, you remove the collimators or the septa in front of the PET detectors, and you get a gain in sensitivity close to 5. But that, of course, and that, of course, was the solution. That is, was one of the solutions that brought PET really in the market because I remember when I started, a PET examination was about an hour and even more because you needed attenuation correction from a line source. Now, what is going to affect this is crystal nature and the size, uh, the geometry of the design, and, of course, the signal-to-noise improvements which will be more on, I would say, a kind of technology and software uh, mix. Now, if you look at PET detection, what you are really looking at is uh, stopping 511 KVs. And to do this, you need a high density and, uh, on the other hand, an, an, an high atomic number. Why is this atomic number important? Uh, there is a clear uh, and a very simple answer is that the higher the atomic number, the more you will have uh, a high photofraction. That means that 
the, the relation in between the photoelectric effect that you will have in your, uh, in your uh, measurements will be affected by this. So if you have a high effective uh, Z number, you will have a higher photo, uh, photo fraction uh, uh, part. Now the other thing is the decay time because a crystal gives light but it can give light fast or it can give light slow. And this will affect uh, the PET detection and you will see that today everybody is using about the same crystals. And then of course uh, there is the thickness of your crystal because then I will, I will show a slide, and this is the slide here. What is happening is if you compare LSO, there are actually three crystals on the market. Huh? LSO, LISO, these are the fast ones, and the other was BGO, which has been very much used in the past. Now, BGO, if you look at comparing BGO, LSO, and LISO, you see that for 100% of gamma rays, you will have, for 20 millimeter thickness, you will have like, I would say 46 to, uh, well, maybe 40, 43% of uh, light conversion. So 43% of the incoming gamma rays will be transformed in light. The other ones will be lost, okay? Now, if you took LSO, this will go close to 48, 49. If you use BGO, you have 60. Right? And you can compare these different things, and that is one of the factors that will influence the sensitivity on your system. But then, if you look at these different uh, factors, you see that going from 2 to 3 centimeters, you can increase the sensitivity of the crystal detection by 46%. So it is not a wrong idea to have long crystals. The only backdrop is if you have long crystals, the price is going to be different because the price is going up with the quantity of material. Okay? Now, the other thing is the size of the tunnel or the gantry, actually the ring size. The more you open the ring and the less you will have sensitivity because you will lose a lot of them outside the ring. And this, you can see, going from 91 to 81, you will gain something like 25, 26%. And then last but not least, I would say, is the axial field of view because if I was a dreamer, I would have a pet that would have a length of two meters. I put my patient in, press the button, I take the patient out. It takes 10 seconds. But this is very expensive, okay? Now, if you look at the crystals, the best, the best crystals for pet are clearly today LISO and LSO. Okay, they're very similar. Um, LISO was actually invented by uh, Quartz Cecilis in France to try to encompass a patent that uh, uh, Siemens had on LSO. LSO had a strong patent that went out two years ago, but in the meantime, uh, companies wanted to sell systems. I believe that Philips has been selling a lot of time-of-flight systems uh, during that period, and they were using LISO, which is LSO, uh, with a bit of yttrium. One important thing about these crystals is, of course, that when you have fast crystals, you have a guarantee of short decay time, and that is a mandatory uh, function for doing 3D PET and time of flight. Now, what is 3D PET compared to 2D PET? If you look at the ring, in the past, because of the non-capability of doing 3D good images, because of scatter, randoms, and all these things, uh, you were putting a septa. So that means that one crystal on one side would only look at two or three crystals on the other side, where in 3D you remove the septa. Now one crystal on one side might be looking at all crystals on the other side. And that increases your sensitivity dramatically. So that was the first step, and to be able to do this, you really had to have uh, fast crystals. Now the second thing that you can do, and you have an example here, this is a machine from uh, Siemens, where you can see that the system is being provided with three rings, that is a standard uh, design. This is like 16 centimeters, 16.5 centimeter field of view. If you add one ring, very expensive, okay, if you add one ring, you have 21.6 uh, centimeters. But of course, by doing this, 
you have an increase in sensitivity because now you have more crystals looking at much more crystals so the sensitivity gain is about 70 percent but you're not only gaining on sensitivity you're also gaining on the bed overlap or the bed uh, position needed for the same um, acquisition area because these ones for example one two three four five six seven you would need eight bed positions and because the sensitivity is about 50 percent less than a four rings because you have less crystals you would say oops you would say seven i said eight times three minutes where this one will do one two three four five six times two minutes eventually okay so this represents 50 percent of uh, decrease in dose or in uh, time. One of the problems in PET is um, the capability to maintain resolution on the sides. If you look at the PET ring, this is the ring, when you are in the middle, the gamma rays that are coming from annihilation will be hitting one crystal on the longest uh, distance. I mean, if there are 20, 25, whatever, 30 millimeter, and it comes from the front, you almost have a full guarantee that the gamma rays will be stopped and stopped in that singular or particular crystal. That means that you have a very nice signal to noise, uh, not signal, point spread function. This is the signal that you will get in this case. But the more you go to the edges, and the more you will have this effect here, where a gamma ray can come in, eventually interact with this one, or this one, or that one. And of course I took only three crystals, but this is over many, many crystals. That means that on the side, the point spread function now looks at something like this. What does that mean? That means that you lose resolution and contrast. So a point in the middle will start being an egg on the edges. Okay. Now, what companies have been doing is that they can eventually uh, correct for this. So if you analyze your system, if you modelize your system properly, you can in the reconstruction algorithm, and now we're talking about software, you can correct for this point spread function defaults, re-inject them in the uh, reconstruction of your camera, and then you get these kind of results. And this is actually uh, available from all companies you call it high resolution PET, you call it high definition PET, you call it HD PET, whatsoever. I think that if you look at this patient, this patient has been acquired uh, on a PET and uh, processed with, I would say, a standard way of doing. Now, if you apply this point spread function, that's where you get. So there is a huge uh, improvement in the image quality. And uh, the other interesting thing that is, for me, uh, even more interesting, is that you have an increase in signal-to-noise ratio, about 40%. And as soon as you increase the signal-to-noise ratio, it means that you can eventually reduce the dose or reduce the time. And uh, I have a good example here. If you look, this is the worst possible case. I mean, a big patient uh, on, a, on, a, on a pet. Uh, these images uh, are reconstructed with, with a standard uh, algorithm. If you apply these point spread function corrections, that's where you get. So you see that the, this point spread function is a very important thing, and uh, the gain of 50% uh, can of course be applied on the dose to the patients. Now, compare conventional to time of flight. In conventional, what we do is that as soon as a, as a crystal sees a gamma ray coming in on one side, it waits for a time and it, then it says, okay, is something happening on the other side? If yes, we have an event on this line, and that is called a line of response. And that is the way we acquire PET in a standard mode. Now, the problem when we construct this is that you accumulate all the noise from this line here, then you have the signal, and you have the noise along all of all this line as well. So that means that knowing where it is, if you could precisely say it's here, and that is the perfect time of flight, then you would have, you would have a very bright and a very contrasted signal, where you would have no noise before, no noise afterwards. Now in time of flight technology and with the limits of the electronics today, you can go down to 500 picoseconds, which is already uh, pretty fast. By doing this, you will reduce these lines and you will actually 
divide them in, and I will just go straight here, you will divide them in, uh, I would say, small segments. Now, not only the detector now can tell you it happened along this line, but it is also able to tell you it happened along this line, but in this area. And that means that all the noise that we had here and here has been removed. And of course, that means that time of flight, again, will give you a signal to noise improvement that is important, 50% again, and uh, excellent image quality. And I think if you look at this, you can see the improvements uh, on image quality uh, when you use time of flight or non-time of flight. One thing that is of course very important when we're talking about the PET CT is also the CT side and on the CT side uh, some companies are actually proposing what they call adaptive dose shield and I like this image, sorry, I like this example because now when you have to when you have to give water and water is expensive especially in these countries when you have to give water to your plant what actually you're usually doing is that you're wasting that part Oops, and you're also wasting that one. So if you invent a clever way to recover the water from here, not spill it there, and then end it there, you have been gaining a lot of water. Now this is exactly what's happening in uh, some of the uh, CT technologies where you have what we call dynamic collimation or adaptive collimation, and, yeah, of course, this is not going to work. I think that all the movies have disappeared, but I will come back to this. But on the result, actually, it's funny that the, the flowers were working, eh? The computer must be green. <laughs> okay. Now, the thing is that when, when you look at this... Left? Yeah? Hold on. Click. No, no. Here? Yeah. And I use it. No, it doesn't work. It worked when I tried. But I will show them later. I can take them one by one. But you have an extra dose reduction when you do this, of course. Now, if you look at cardiac, cardiac is a very demanding uh, CT, uh, CT dose thing, and you, you could have doses very high. So there are solutions today to reduce the dose. And... Um, you have, I would say, the adaptive ECG pulsing is one of the methods where you will only uh, shoot on the CT in that area. And it is actually doing a spiral acquisition. And then you have uh, another solution that is the cardio uh, adaptive sequence where you do step and shoot. And by doing this, you will have excellent cardiology results with only, and I would say even lower today, but 1.5 millisieverts with these kind of results. Okay. Now there is also a solution in uh, neurology where uh, a company is providing you uh, PET CT scans without the need of doing a CT scan for attenuation uh, on a brain uh, patient. And this is being done because they accumulated a lot of patients over the years. They've been uh, finding up a very good algorithm to do this, and they actually no, don't need any attenuation uh, CT or attenuation map from the CT. They use a dedicated database, and uh, this seems to be working very well. Another thing, and I would say this again is very good for uh, technologies, is that if you look at, um, yeah, I need I need to scan the lungs, right? What you can do is you can put this area on the lungs. And then, of course, you will have done, sorry, oops. And, of course, you will have done or you will have lost that area, which is interesting. But now, on the other hand, cross the fingers, if you do it manually, uh, you could eventually say, I don't want to miss the lungs. I will do it a little bit more. But then this dose is added and is not necessary. So if you have a clever way, and you find this on modern uh, CTs today, to do it for you, this, uh, these things will actually use uh, landmarks in the bodies, and by, by doing this and using the topogram, it will be able to tell you, okay, exactly from here to there. This is another way of reducing the dose. Now, 
The nuclear medicine, we're very used to talk about the relative reconstruction. And it's funny because I've been doing this for years, years. I think we, we started like in, in 95, we were already doing a kind of uh, 3D flash reconstruction uh, within the company I was working for. And I realized that only three or four years ago, the CT was starting to do iterative reconstruction. I said, these CT guys are fool because, you know, they, it took them so long to get there. Actually, there was one thing I absolutely forgot is that when we're talking about uh, nuclear medicine images, we have a couple of slices with a small matrix. And when we're talking about CTs today, these CTs have sub-millimeter resolution. They do acquire a hell of a lot of high-resolution things. So it took some time for the companies to provide what I would say affordable uh, iterative reconstruction because if you now have a fast CT and you do an acquisition on a patient, I would say in less than a minute, and you need 30 minutes to look at the data because of the reconstruction time, this is clinically uh, not applicable, okay? So the companies have been working on this, and I think that we find on CT side today uh, a lot of these uh, iterative reconstructions, but again, very interesting, because iterative reconstruction is giving you a signal-to-noise um, uh, reduction and also uh, reducing the uh, sorry the artifacts in the image and by doing this you can lower the dose again by a factor of 60 percent which is uh, very important some of the systems you have seen that uh, we're doing uh, we, we have seen this real-time dose modulation along the patient okay but there's another thing that uh, you can find on uh, modern CT systems and that is actually this if you look at uh, the systems most of the applications are uh, being are being acquired in well, an energy of I would say 120 kV um, if you have a child, you better lower uh, the KV and we can, we can today find protocols uh, where the KV settings will be adapted to the patient and also to the organ of the patient. And this is very important when we're talking about pediatrics because pediatrics, uh, the kids are really something we have to be very careful about. Now, what have the companies been working on and what do they work on today? Dose saving those monitoring, those reporting. Those saving, we have seen, we've seen that there is a lot of technology behind. Um, I would say they're trying to, to work on different aspects, whether you're talking about adults, non-adults. Uh, the other thing is those monitoring, because uh, we need a better control of patient dose. Uh, you also need today to be informed uh, whether a patient will be a little bit overburned or not and then of course those reporting and this is what you can find today with the DICOM uh, structure thing and as a final slide I could not resist to show you a very exciting CT dynamic study which says thanks for your attention.